Okay, can I just have a thumbs up from Martin if you can see my screen? Yeah, thank you, great. Okay, well, welcome from me. My name is Malcolm Cook. Um, I'm based here at Loughborough University and I'm a co-lead of theme one on coupled indoor outdoor environments along with Martin Van Rooyvik from Imperial College who you'll be meeting later on. Um, I'd also like to, to recognize and thank Helen Freeman who's our network coordinator who's doing all the fantastic clever magic in the background to make sure that we we're we're in the right place talking about the right thing at the right time so thank you thank you helen um so theme one then the aims of theme one um are to uh, identify all mechanisms for ingress and egress of, of air and of course that carries with it um lots of things co2 pollutants fresh air hopefully and um to identify and recognize all of these mechanisms of, of flow into and out of buildings and to assess the tools and the techniques that are available um, at the moment for, for quantifying and simulating this air exchange, but also to think about what we might need in the future if we're going to, to design buildings which are fit for purpose. Um, and that means that means healthy and productive. And we'll hear a little bit more about that in the first presentation uh, this morning. And ultimately, what we'd like to do is to draft at least one position paper which presents the, the, these issues and current state of the art and the opportunities um, in terms of moving forwards um, as to how we might simulate coupled indoor outdoor environments. And Martin will say a little bit more about that as we move into um, as we move into the breakout sessions in the afternoon. So specifically today, then, what's our workshop about? We've entitled it "Perspectives on Ventilation and Air Quality Modelling." Um, so what we're interested in here is to to find out about what mathematical models are used currently by by all building stakeholders. So this is not a building physics. Uh, seminar. It, 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 it's, it's a seminar for manufacturers, it's a seminar for users, anyone who, who needs to understand, who wants to understand internal, external air exchange um, in buildings. So what are the stakeholder needs? What do architects need? What do, what do engineers need? What, what do uh, policymakers need in terms of, in terms of understanding ventilation, um, air quality and modeling, both at the design stage and also, and also at the operational stage. And throughout today, we encourage you to think about the F in, in FUVEN, Future Urban Ventilation Network, to think about the future rather than um, how we've done things in the past. What do we need to innovate? What do we need to, to improve, improve our building stock? And I'm uh, very much Looking forward to Thomas's presentation towards the end of the morning, where we look at what what he's been working on out in out in Singapore. Um, so our morning schedule then, um, after the two welcome introductions, we'll move into our our um, six presentations. Um, again, hopefully representing the range of stakeholders um, from from manufacturers to modelers, to policymakers and, and designers. Each, each, presentation, um, each presentation has got 20 minutes allocated to it. The way I uh, plan to run that is 15 minutes presentation with five minutes, uh, with five minutes Q and A. And then we'll have a 45 minute break for lunch and then reconvene at one o'clock for our breakout discussions. And we'll say more about that later on. Okay, so so welcome. Uh, that's it from me. I'm now going to hand over to Jim Stewart Evans, who's going to present with Christos Hallius um, uh, from Public Health England, um, grounding us in the basis of, of regulations and um, why we do ventilation. Um, so Jim, over to over to you. Just need to stop. Okay, so hopefully you can hear me and hopefully you can see my screen. So yeah. 
Christos Nye from the Centre for Radiation Chemicals and Environmental Hazards in Public Health England, and we're the Public Health England's representatives on the um, Breathing City um, network. And today, really, um, we're aiming to give you a bit of a whistle-stop tour of the health burden of exposure to indoor and air pollution, taking a bit of a step back to think about um, when we're looking at ventilation and modelling, what are we ultimate, ultimately interested in in terms of exposures and health effects. So I'm going to um, do the first part of the presentation and pick up on, um, on that and the uh, burden on health associated with air pollution and some of the aspects of how indoor and outdoor environments affect people's exposure. And Christos is then in the second half going to run through some of the health standards and regulations and guidelines that are relevant in both indoor and outdoor settings. Um, I'll drop a link into the chat after this to some of the materials that some of these infographics and so on come from because we've got some um, more detail um, that people can look at because we won't have a huge amount of time today. Um, in terms of sources of air pollution, um, it's a mix of, of particulate matter and gases from both natural and man-made sources. We're interested in particulate matter and nitrogen dioxide um, as major components of urban air pollution. So most local authorities, most council, local authority, um, air quality management areas relate to nitrogen dioxide, mainly from traffic. And another recognised issue you can see in the top right of this slide is residential combustion. So if you think about things like wood burning um, stoves in urban areas, that's a significant tr contributor to primary particulate matter in urban areas. And the thing when considering um, particulate matter and nitrogen dioxide in particular is that there's no clear evidence of a safe level of exposure below which there's no risk of adverse health effects. So what that, what that really means is that although we have standards for particulate matter and nitrogen dioxide, any improvement in exposure, any reduction in those pollutants is associated with additional health benefits of population health benefits. So we turn to sources of indoor air pollution here. Um, the air, indoor air pollutants that can harm health include things like products of combustion from domestic appliances that burn carbon containing fuels, volatile organic compounds from cleaning and personal care products and building materials and household consumer products, uh, tobacco smoke and secondhand smoke, and also um, radon. So radon is a naturally occurring radioactive gas it's generally not a problem in outdoor air, but it can accumulate in buildings and there's an increased risk of lung cancer if exposed to high levels of radon for a long time. And it's actually the second highest cause of lung cancer after smoking. So in terms of health effects, um, when air pollutants enter the body, they can have effects on various um, organs and systems. It's not just the respiratory system. On the left-hand side, you can see there are short-term effects um, respiratory effects and increased hospital admissions and mortality after air pollution events. So episodes of poor outdoor air quality can lead to increased hospital admissions um, afterwards. And there are long-term um, health effects as well, including reduced life expectancy. And I'll say a little bit more about those in due course. Um, it's important to, to say that, that um, although air pollution has various health effects, they come about at every stage of life also, from the first weeks in the womb all the way through to old age. Uh, the three main conditions associated with air pollution are respiratory conditions such as asthma, cardiovascular disease and lung cancer, but there's emerging evidence for other outcomes like dementia, and low birth weight and type 2 um, diabetes as well. So in terms of the scale of the problem, um, epidemiological studies have shown that long-term exposure over years or lifetimes reduces life expectancy, and that's mainly due to the cardiovascular um, and respiratory diseases and lung cancer associated with exposure to air pollution. But the annual effect in the UK is estimated as equivalent to 28 to 36,000 deaths. So poor air quality is the um, largest environmental risk to public health in the UK. And looking at the right hand side of the slide on here, just to put that into context, the average concentration of fine particulate matter from man made sources in England in 2019 is about nine micrograms per cubic metre. And some modelling that's been carried out in the past for public health, England's estimated the benefits of a one microgram per cubic metre reduction. So that's a one ninth 
improvement in fine particulate air pollution. You can see um, on the right hand side that there's potentially significant reductions in cases of coronary heart disease, strokes, asthma and lung cancer associated with um, improving, um, improving air quality and re reducing concentrations of fine particulate matter. So looking um, from the outdoor to the, to the indoor, Across the EU, the annual burden of disease caused by indoor air pollution has been estimated to correspond to an annual loss of about 2 million healthy life years. Um, and that relates to both indoor sources, but also polluted outdoor air used to ventilate indoor spaces. And similarly to outdoor air quality, the health burden is predominantly due to cardiovascular disease and lung cancer and fine particulate matter. You can see in the bottom pie chart here, um, does make a significant overall contribution. You can see it there in red on the pie chart. Um, but what you can also see there is that um, there's also an impact indoors from exposures to radon, secondhand smoke, carbon monoxide, um, the health impacts associated with damp and bioaerosols and volatile organic compounds that um, are particular to, to indoor exposures um, compared to outdoors. And this slide shows some of the groups that are more affected by air pollution. Um, although it can be harmful to everyone, some people are more affected, and that's either because they live in a polluted area, they're exposed to higher levels of air pollution in their day to day lives, or they're more susceptible to health problems caused by air pollution, perhaps because they have pre existing cardiovascular disease or respiratory diseases. And the most vulnerable um, groups have got all of those disadvantages in terms of potentially pre existing health conditions and also living in. Um, poor outdoor or indoor environments or combinations thereof. Your exposure um, to air pollution can be dominated by indoor or outdoor sources. So if we move through this um, diagram from the uh, short term peaks in outdoor air pollution um, in the bottom left, they can um, affect indoor exposures. So if you think about air pollution episodes and times when there are high concentrations of pollutants outdoors, so maybe rush hour times in, in a city or when weather conditions leading to reduced dispersion of outdoor um, pollutants, that can affect indoor concentrations. And in the longer term, in the bottom right, in the absence of any other factors, indoor concentrations tend towards outdoor concentrations. So there's a longer term correlation between outdoor concentrations of things like particulate matter and nitrogen dioxide in, in outdoor air and indoor concentrations. Uh, but looking at the top of the diagram, indoor exposures, of course, can be dominated by indoor sources themselves. So if we consider short-term high concentrations, it could be things like faulty boilers um, leading to carbon monoxide poisonings or times when people cook or use household products in confined spaces with poor ventilation and subsequently have not um, high short-term exposures and in the longer term indoors um, the exposures there can relate to more constant releases so it could be things like ground gases like radon it may be emissions of volatile organic compounds from furniture or building products or it could be recurring um, indoor activities like smoking indoors that, that, that lead to the um, longer term indoor exposures. So within the network, um, if we consider a typical British high street, it's one of the case studies we've become interested in um, as part of the work. This word cloud um, shows some of the factors that might affect people's exposure in that context. And, and what I'd say is that it's, it's not just the indoor and outdoor sources of pollution that we need to think about. So traffic and activities in restaurants and small businesses and so on, but also their locations and dispersion of pollutants in relation to people. And all the factors that affect where emissions and people um, can be in time and space are relevant when we start to consider exposure and trying to reduce exposure. And of course, there's a behavioural element as well here. So people's behaviour expects it, uh, people's behaviour affects their exposure as well. And factors such as noise and thermal comfort and security and so on influence both how people heat and ventilate the spaces, um, but that in turn affects their exposure um, to pollutants. And I'm now going to hand over to Christos for the second half of the presentation. He's going to summarise some of the standards and um, guidelines in outdoor and, and indoor context. Oh, Christos, I think you're on mute. Um, 
me see. Can you hear me now? I can, yeah. Let me mute myself before I start probably generating some awful feedback. Thanks. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Christos, we've got a really bad line there. Um, there's lots of feedback. Try again, um, Chris, because I think you've, you seem to be dialed in twice. So I think we could probably mute one of you and unmute the other one. I don't know if you can hear me now. That's much better. That's better. Is, yep. is it better? Just give me one second because I can't hear myself. Is it okay now? Sounds fine. Okay, fantastic. Great. Thanks. Um, so thank you, Jim. Uh, apologies for the inconvenience. I am connected with two computers. Uh, in one, the camera doesn't work, and the other one, obviously, it creates the problem. So the, this was the reason. Uh, Jim, if you're happy to, uh, to help me with the slides, to move around the slides, it would be great. So good morning, everyone. Um, in the following slides, I will try to, uh, to, to cover a little bit of, uh, of the ground of, of the landscape of standards, guidance, and guidelines in the United Kingdom. Um, in particular, the starting point for this discussion is the, um, uh, the WHO's guidelines published in 2000 uh, for both long and short term exposure for a list of uh, gases, particulate matter, volatile organic compounds, um, and radon. It was updated in 2006. And in 2010, they published a list uh, for guideline values uh, for the indoor air uh, for nine uh, pollutants, again, for both long and short term uh, exposures, uh, following a European project, the EU index project that followed a, um, a similar methodolo methodology. Um, in a few days, on the, uh, the 22nd of September, WHO, they will uh, publish the updated uh, guideline values. So we are waiting um, for that. Next slide, please. Thanks. Um, in the UK and England, Acts of Parliament related with uh, with indoor air, the UK, the UK Clean Air Act in 1968 made it an offence to emit dark smoke from a chimney. The Building Act in 1984 consolidated previous legislation concerning the construction process. Uh, the Health Act, the Environment Act in 1995, uh, we'll be referring to that, and the Health Act in 2006. Uh, whereby smoke-free legislation came into force in England from the 1st of July 2007. So the next slides will try to discuss a little bit on uh, the, uh, the national uh, legislation and guidances and guidelines. Next slide, please. Um, the UK must comply with the national air quality objectives and EU limit and target values that followed European directives. At the national level, the, 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 uh, the Department of Environment, Food and Rural Affairs is responsible for meeting their quality target values in England. Next slide, please. And they published in 2019 the Clean Air Strategy, whereby they focus on five uh, categories of pollutants for the indoor air. They are introducing actions to reduce emissions at home, focusing on PM 2.5 and non-methane volatile organic compounds. Next slide, please. Acknowledging the fact uh, that local authorities have a central role in achieving improvements in air quality, TEFRA has established a local air quality management system 
um, through which local authorities are required to assess air quality in their areas. This will be updated in the April 2022 following consultation that now is underway. And in this new version, a chapter will be included in indoor quality following, following the NICE guidance, uh, to which we'll refer as well uh, in the next slides. Next slide, please. Statutory guidance, uh, the building regulations, in particular the approved document text discussing ventilation, uh, includes recommended performance criteria for carbon monoxide, ozone, nitrogen, nitrogen dioxide, and total volatile organic compounds. Um, it was in uh, uh, consultation until, until January 2021, I think, and now they are updating the document where we uh, it will be, uh, they will refer to the um, uh, Public Health England guidance. Uh, I will uh, discuss in a minute. Next slide, please. Um, from uh, the occupational exposure point of view, uh, the focus on workers in industrial environments, the uh, work, uh, workplace exposure limits um, are set both for short term and long term. Um, and following the assignment of a workplace exposure limit to a substance, then they are subject to the requirements of the control of substances hazardous to health regulation. Next slide, please. Um, Non-statutory guidance, uh, the guidelines on ventilation, thermal comfort, and indoor quality in school published by the Department of, of Education um, in 2020, where the pollutant levels in science, design, and technology enter, they should uh, be kept below the levels discussed in um, um, in the health and safety executive uh, guidance we discussed previously. Next slide, please. And the Public Health England published in 2019 the indoor quality guidelines for selected vol volatile organic compounds. They refer to both short and long term limit values for a range of volatile organic compounds. Um, this document has been referenced now in the, uh, um, in, the um, um, in the consultation uh, we referred previously, and we are currently working on semi-volatile organic compounds. Next slide, please. Three guidances by other organizations uh, the national institute for health and care excellence um, published in 2020 the indoor quality at home now this is it, this is referenced in the updated version of uh, the local air quality management uh, guidance um, the health and well-being in building services by the uh, CIPSE and also the inside story published by the royal college of pediatrics and child health the, all of them, they include Public Health England's uh, guide, uh, guidelines on uh, select volatile organic compounds. And next slide, the final slide to, to summarize the previous, um, how we can improve uh, health. Um, first of all, avoiding uh, exceedances of health-based guideline values we just discussed reducing lifetime exposure to pollutants relating with uh, acute exposures, actions are clearer, but for long-term exposures, a complex balancing act must be taken into account because different factors uh, are involved. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Christos. Thank you, Jim. Um, we do have time for, for some questions. Um, so you can either raise your hand or you can type something in the chat. You can raise your hand by hitting the reactions icon bottom right. And when you click on that, you get a raise hand option. And if I don't see anybody and you've got your hand up, just interrupt me. Any questions? <clears throat> I don't see any I don't see any hands up. Um, so I'd like to ask um, well either of you really. Um, 
something about the recent government initiative to introduce uh, CO2 sensors into schools um, in the UK. Um, has PHE had any involvement in this and is it something that's going to be useful? Uh, I, I could try and answer, but it's going to be a short one because the answer is I don't know. Uh, yeah. I don't know if the air quality and public health team mm -hmm. have been involved in that um, mm -hmm. at all, Christos. Um, I mean, I, thinking it through, I, mean, it, it, I, I always take the view that more more information is helps you make a more informed decision in, in theory, if you know how to interpret it and the and people have the guidance and everything to, to go with it. So it seems to be a positive step, but I, I don't know if we have been part of that um, or not. I, I don't know, Christos, if you and Sunny have been involved or not. I can see Christos shaking his head. No, I'm not. I'm not sure either. Probably, probably Sunny was involved, but I'm not. I'm not sure about that. Okay. Okay. Uh, that's okay. I mean, I, I am. Um, I I can't help thinking that that um, raising awareness of these things um, as a result of the pandemic in this case, raising awareness can only be can only be a good thing. Um, you know, one of the things we have to remember here is. Um, it, is that air is invisible. Um, so anything we can do to make it more visible, um, which Leora will be speaking about later on, I think can only be a good thing. Any, any other questions or comments from anyone before we move on? No. Okay. Thank you, Jim. Thank you, Christos. I'm now going to introduce Anna Cross from, from Eltafans, who's the AHU product manager there over in the West Midlands. Um, welcome, Anna. And uh, when you are ready, please, please share your screen. Hello, good morning, everyone. And uh, thank you once again, Malcolm, to uh, um, uh, invite me to take part in, uh, in today's uh, workshop. Um, I'll try to keep an eye on the timer so I don't uh, overrun because I, I, I tend to go on forever talking about these issues because they're, they're quite um, um, close, to, to close to my heart. So uh, I'll share my screen now and we'll just uh, get started. Are you able to see my screen now? Yes, we can. Yeah. Okay. So, uh, um, so I'm I'm Anna Cross, uh, as my Malcolm said, AHU product manager for Elta Fans. Uh, so we're based in the West Midlands, and we're obviously a um, um, a mechanical ventilation um, manufacturer. And um, I'll talk you through some of the challenges we've been uh, experiencing throughout the years. Uh, with a particular type of product called the uh, air handling units, um, mainly because the um, uh, European directives as well as uh, uh, building regs uh, have been um, uh, driven these products to be as energy efficient as possible. So the drive for the past sort of decade has been uh, reduced the demand on, on mains power supply. So quickly, what I'll, what I'll do throughout this presentation is just to give you um, a, a very quick understanding of what is an air handling unit, what types um, can we have of air handling units, where do they fit in, in, the, in the building, in the whole of the ventilation system, and then uh, what are the challenges and the balance that needs to be um, uh, found between um, uh, energy efficient um, uh, products uh, without compromising uh, indoor air quality in the um, in the built environment. Uh, so an air handling unit comes in all uh, shapes and sizes and uh, with all different types of uh, specialized uh, HVAC components fitted uh, inside them. They are a mechanical ventilation equipment that is part of the HVAC system uh, in a building. 
So the HVAC uh, system is the, the heating um, and ventilation and air conditioning uh, equipment uh, that's creating um, uh, or allowing the building to, to breathe effectively, right? So to, to control the, um, the environment for the users inside the building. Um, so we've got uh, air handling units that can be single flow units. Uh, we call these uh, just outdoor uh, supply units. So what they're doing is uh, filtering the incoming air, um, changing uh, the temperature of the air, either uh, warming it up or cooling it down, depending on the requirements. And then we have a dual flow uh, type of air handling units. And these are what we call nowadays heat recovery units. And again, driven by um, eco-design directives and uh, building regs in the UK. Um, if we're supplying outdoor air into the same occupied space, as well as extracting the air, we must uh, use um, energy recovery um, um, technology. So in, this, in, this, in these two types of air handling units, they are dual flow um, uh, units. So you've got both supply and extract air streams running through the specialized components inside uh, the same box. And uh, we have components that range from um, uh, several stages of filtration. Uh, again, depending on the location of the building, depending on the specification, the application of the uh, and use of that project building. Um, we have different uh, um, uh, components that do uh, the, the heating or the cooling of that air. Um, the, the, the incoming air can also be humidified, dehumidified, depending on, um, on the conditions required. And then the energy recovery components. Um, um, you, we've got two main forms of these energy recovery components. We've got the um, air-to-air -air heat exchangers. We call it the plate heat exchangers, cross-flow or counter-flows. And then we have the thermal rotary wheels um, that offer um, the benefits of uh, um, allowing the, the whole of the air handling unit to have a, a more compact footprint. So in this case, the um, plate heat exchanges, there are no moving parts. So although both air streams go through the fins of the heat exchanger to allow for um, thermal um, exchange of um, of the heat or cooling load between the two air streams, the air streams never mixed. So there's no potential risk for cross contamination at all. Again, driven by um, uh, regulations and uh, directives, these components also include um, and are built, have built in a bypass facility. So in case uh, and in the uh, seasons where the temperature differentials between indoors and outdoors uh, isn't um, um, great enough, there might not be a benefit to the ventilation system for recovering any heat from the, the, the stale air from inside the building fabric. So in that case, what happens is the control system will automatically open the bypass and I don't want to be uh, reusing any of that air energy uh, because my, my comfort levels of uh, indoor temperature are uh, well stable. Um, so I'll just um, bypass that and, uh, and the air will be exhausted straight into the atmosphere without any heat recovery. The thermal wheels are um, another type. They have a moving part. So this uh, red area uh, disc uh, here is the um, effectively where the thermal transfer happens. So you've got um, um, uh, um, a diameter of uh, aluminium um, fins um, in a honeycomb structure coiled together um, to make up this, uh, this diameter. They, they come in all different sizes, depending on uh, uh, the amount of air that we're moving through, through the air handling unit. Uh, and they rotate very, very slowly. And what they're doing, they're transferring the heat or cooling load from the um, uh, stale air coming in from the inside the building. And before it gets dumped into the atmosphere, that thermal mass gets transferred uh, back into the supply airstream. So then when you need to temper the air that it's coming in uh, into the occupied space, 
you're reducing the demand on your mains power supply. So basically, this is just a, a, a quick flavor of how um, uh, regulations and directives have shaped um, these heat recovery and have driven energy efficiency um, across these types of products. Um, so let me tell you as well that in the past uh, uh, decade, we've uh, we've seen the the um, huge development in uh, uh, impeller and motor technology, so the fan uh, arrangement. So we used to be dealing with belt-driven fans. We're now working with uh, um, what we call in the industry direct-driven fans with EC motors. They are much more efficient. There are no losses uh, from the belts. Um, the motor is directly mounted into the um, impeller shaft. So um, all of the input power is directly transferred into into airflow, so the losses are very very small. And then, um, in terms of um, controllability, so when we want to speed control these fans, instead of using the um, um, the a AC motors with an inverters that have um, a power loss associated. Uh, mainly depending on how they, they work together. Um, an EC motor is um, uh, controlled via a, an, an auto 10 volt signal. So all, all that is required is um, um, a little um, a type of equipment called a potentiometer. And um, across the 0 to 10 volt range, you can speed or slow down the fan depending on your airflow demands. And this is all uh, then attached to an intelligent control system that can be pre-programmed, um, such as that one, that can pre-program sensors can be uh, added to the inside of the air handling units, to the ductwork, to the rooms where, where the users are. Uh, so the whole system works uh, in response to, to the demand of the indoor environment. Now, moving forward, um, to this, these are just examples of what those models sort of would look like. Uh, this is um, the, the modeling of the air handling unit against a given specification uh, via our own uh, uh, software suite. So we, we, we would be working um, with the um, uh, specification team, and this is how they actually work once they go out uh, from the shop floor. So they, they, can, they come in all shapes and sizes. Um, uh, different applications from um, um, office blocks to um, commercial buildings, retail schools, etc., to spray booths, for instance. Um, these are outdoor uh, units with just filter fan uh, heater arrangement. Now, in terms of the challenge that we've been facing um, uh, to comply with all these regulations, because if, if we're putting these products into the market, they have to be compliant. Uh, when they're handed over within a project building, uh, they have to comply with building regs regulations. And, and these have been driven by um, um, reducing energy consumption. So the focus is on specific fan powers, the amount of energy that those fans are uh, using to be able to move those masses of air to and from the building, uh, as well as how much uh, energy recovery am I doing in, um, in that equipment. Uh, so throughout the uh, implementations of eco-design directives, we've so far had two tiers. The first tier happened in 2016. The second one, which is the one we're currently working uh, at, is the second tier of uh, 2018. And um, uh, there's a huge list of requirements that had to be met, but I'll just focus on uh, um, the, um, the need for um, bypass facilities on, on, the, on the heat uh, exchanges for heat recovery, the levels of efficiency that have been increased from one tier to the next. So we've jumped from uh, uh, a minimum of 67% energy recovery to 73% energy recovery. So if I'm working on a project today for a heat recovery unit for a building, um, I need to ensure that my selection of that component is hitting at least a minimum, minimum of 73% uh, 
energy recovery against uh, uh, standard uh, conditions that, that are uh, written down in, in the standard as, as well. Um, so as you can see, if, if we apply all of those criteria into the design of an air handling unit, uh, so this would be a unit designed um, a few years ago. So this is 2015, prior to the implementation of these uh, directives and regulations. Uh, we used to use best practice, and the best practice then was mainly driven by um, the constraints of the space. So um, give me the smallest unit that can move the most amount of air um, that fits in my plant room. Basically, that, that was it, right? So these are very sort of um, small and compact units. Uh, so I'm just using this grid to give you a visual representation of how they had to change to incorporate these changes from driven by regulations. On tier one, we're now saying that um, that efficiency level of that component now needs to be a minimum of 63, uh, 67%. So my footprint starts to increase, okay? Uh, on top of that, I've got requirements for specific fan powers. So my velocities through the, the unit have to reduce. There's no way, uh, other way of achieving this. It's pure physics. If you change, if you squeeze the box further, you're going to have higher internal pressure drops, uh, higher velocities. You're going to need more power to drive that mass of air through the components. OK, so we're going the opposite way. We want we need to make the units bigger so that the, the internal velocities and the inter internal losses through these components are uh, less. So the amount of power that I'm using to drive these fans is now less. And attached to the, uh, uh, again, requirements that the efficiency levels for energy recovery are, are increasing. So the net gain is, um, is positive, okay? Now, this is all very good, but where does indoor air quality fit into, into this? And uh, uh, up until- About five minutes, Anna. Oh, five, five minutes, minutes, my goodness, yeah, I'll speed it up. So up until 2016, we, uh, we were working on a, a very old uh, uh, standard um, that was uh, EN 779 that talked about uh, filtration of classes such as G4, F7 uh, filters XYZ. Now with the new standard uh, ISO 16890, the filtration classes now relate to particle sizes. Okay, so we're talking about EPM, uh, EPM ones, uh, EPM two fives, EPM tens, and these are particle sizes, as you know, that they affect directly our um, um, breathing apparatus. So from our top airways down to the alveoli in our lungs. Okay, so what this standard is doing for us is pushing the designing teams of uh, buildings, not just new buildings, but refer projects as well, to think about their location of their project building. What is the outdoor air look like? And what is the supply air category um, uh, that I want to de um, deliver in my project building? So we've, uh, we've developed a, a few CPDs on this and we're pushing our, uh, the designing teams to take at least five steps uh, during the early stages of their projects. Think about the location of the project building, understand what the um, outdoor air quality looks like and what is the uh, required supply uh, air quality category that you want to achieve. And then you understand quickly uh, how much filtration you're going to need. So if I want to achieve at least um, uh, these levels of uh, particulate matter uh, in my uh, incoming air from the outside, and if I, I'm in working in a zone that's classified as an ODA3, so um, a suburban area uh, with high levels of particulates, I'm going to have to up my filtration uh, specification to remove um, at least 80% of that uh, load to give me uh, a good um, 
air quality in my indoor space. Okay. I move forward uh, in terms of the the modelling of what we've been doing as well uh, to understand the effectiveness the effectiveness of all these uh, ventilation uh, strategies. Uh, we've been um, uh, uh, one of the stakeholders for um, this um, uh, vent AC um, uh, project from uh, UKRE, uh, which is a CFD uh, model, and we've used it in our own uh, office. Um, whilst the office was undergoing reset air certification. So we had access to three indoor air quality monitors continuously collecting data that helped us to validate uh, the, um, the progression of the CFD model uh, on top of uh, changing slowly um, the way the ventilation system was feeding um, the air in into the space. So we, we've stabilized the model to allow us for comfortable temperature. Um, we've understood that our age of air inside of office, as it stands, is of 1800 seconds. So this is also called the fresh air index. So it just, uh, um, uh, it's a combination of uh, understanding the CO2 levels, how the CO2 um, distributes in the space, and how long it takes for the mass of air to be exchanged. Um, so this roughly um, tells you that we found there's a, a problem corner here uh, where although we have a good mixture of the airflow inside the space, because uh, the, um, the concentration of uh, people that are mostly talking throughout the day, we are also looking at uh, breathing cycles, talking cycles, how that does that contribute uh, to the indoor environment. We now need to think what we're going to do to um, reduce the amount of CO2 produced mainly in a particular area of the office space. So the ne next step for us would be to understand um, what the outdoor indoor exchange to enhance the indoor air quality uh, of this model is, and potentially mitigating uh, um, uh, measures uh, in the event of a, um, a pathogen being released into, into the space, you know, driven by the current pandemic. Um, so that's pretty much it. So thank you very much. Um, I tried to be as quick as I could, but um, uh, I'm happy to share the, the slides at the end, uh, there's, there's a, an awful lot of information in there that we've, we've skimmed through, uh, but feel free to ask your questions. Thank, Thank you, you very much, Anna. Thank you very much. As you say, lots of, lots of useful information in there. Uh, um, and, and thank you for agreeing to share your slides after the event. Uh, any, any questions or comments from, from anyone? There's a few uh, comments in the chat, Malcolm. Oh right. Okay. Oh, okay. I, I've got I've got uh, Claudia with with her hand up. So Claudia, would you like to ask a question? Hi. Um, I was just wondering about the uh, CFD simulations uh, that you did. Um, I see. Well, you mentioned that you used um, that you took into account like breathing, uh, breathe, people's breathing and people talking. And I just just wanted to know like how, how you chose to, to um, represent that because, well, how do you know when people are talking or how for how long and this kind of things? Yes, yeah, so uh, uh, what we've done, we've, we've, we've done, uh, luckily the way if, if if I go back and share just uh, one slide, um, which is the one that has uh, the layout of the office, if I just do this one, uh, we're lucky. We're lucky actually because uh, um, in our current office setup, we we do have an open plan area, but we also have this little private office here that uh, recently, um, and we've been validating the model for the CO2 distribution in the space, um, we've used this as a controlled room as well. 
So we've had them um, uh, that include one um, certified um, IAQ monitor in it. So first we, we've established what the background CO2 levels were. We've um, gathered data from the office being um, without uh, occupancy, so closed. There was no interaction with the open plan. There was no uh, spillage from the um, airflow uh, mix uh, into this office. Uh, so it com was completely closed. And then we collected data with, uh, it's a single occupancy office, just with one person in it uh, working uh, throughout the day so that we could understand what the contributions of CO2 were uh, during a um, sort of a, um, a non-talking um, event, okay? And then we've defined areas in the office where we know, the because these, these clusters are pl uh, placed and organized depending on the tasks people are doing and departments, uh, we know that the, the, the corner at the bottom of the office is, is a department that spends most time on the phone talking um, with, with other, other of our subsidiaries as well as, as, well as uh, customers. And they talk pretty much throughout the whole day. Okay, so this is how um, uh, we sort of, we're, not, we're learning as we, we're modeling and gathering the data, um, how, how different activities within the office are contributing um, to the CO2 levels and how it, it uh, disperses uh, through, through the space. Did I answer your question? Hello? Yes, yeah, that answers my right. question. Oh, Thank you very much. <laughs> All right. Uh, Thank you for your question, Claudia. Thank you for that, Anna. Anna, there are there are three questions in the chat which I'll invite you to respond to um, um, over the next few few minutes or so uh, because we need to move on now. I'll just end with with the yes. comment from Bernard Hornung in the chat, which I think is is a useful one to end on, and that is, whilst regulations and directives have their place, our future much depends upon innovation. There does need to be a balance so that innovation thrives and i think that Absolutely, that is part, yes. yeah and yeah. that is part of what we're trying to do in this network so thank you for that bernard and anna yes. if i can ask you to to respond to the three questions i will and chat. i'll i'll find i'll finalize my uh, my presentation by by saying that network events such as this are really important to bring uh, different skills from uh, uh, different um, parts of the industry together to create momentum and push these innovative solutions uh, forward. Um, the filtration um, needs to be, and indoor air quality needs to be given uh, a dedicated emphasis. Uh, if there are labels for energy efficiency in buildings, why not have a label for indoor air quality in buildings? Okay, so that's all. Thank you very okay. much. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Anna. Okay, I'm now going to introduce Owen Boswell from Hawley, um, who, who's going to talk to us about uh, a perspective from uh, from engineering practice. Um, Owen, I think you've you've stepped in uh, at the last minute, and if that <laughs> is the case, thank you, thank you very much. But without further ado, I'm going to hand over to you, Owen. Yep. Let me hopefully share screen. And... Sorry, I'm unfamiliar with Zoom, so hopefully you can, if I do this, will you be able to see it? There we go. That's, that's perfect. Perfect. Okay. Hi, um, yeah, so I've stepped in last moment for my colleague, Owen Connick. It's quite funny where there's only two Owens in the whole company. We ended up working in the, in the same team, which is great. A whole manner of confusion. Um, but I'm talking about modeling for engineering design and specifically how currently we're sort of evaluating mixed mode ventilation um, for projects. Uh, so for this, I'm going to use a case study, which is one of the projects that we've been working on over the last couple of years, um, which is a group of these two buildings in central London. For those unfamiliar with London, down the bottom left hand corner here is the, the notorious wonky Millennium Bridge, Tate Modern, and then a couple of streets behind are our two buildings, um, which is the project in question. Um, here's a sort of graphical 
to pick it from the architect. Um, its nickname was Timber Square, mainly because it was a steel and timber floor. So all the floors um, were CLT material. And it was kind of, it's, well, it's earmarked to be one of the largest CLT developments in, in the UK. Um, the building on the right um, in this picture is a completely new build. And the building on the left is a part refurbishment, part new build. Um, but for, for the, throughout this presentation, we're just going to focus on this, this new build development. It's a bit more straightforward. Um, the developer was, was Landsec and the architect was Bennett's Associates. The only thing I want to highlight here is just a, just a look at the facade. It is a curtain wall facade, but just I'm trying to visualize the makeup. It's a bit of like a lattice structure uh, and a grid all across the facade. And that will come important uh, in a second. When we were going through the design process, so our, our REBA stages, REBA stage two, three, um, which is where we're doing our concept design and, and detail design, a side study was created for the UK GBC, um, which was called this building case for net zero. Uh, and there's a link here for the document, should anyone wish to read it after this, when I'll circulate the slides. And its intent was to provide a feasibility study into, into real world implications of, of new net zero buildings. So there was a baseline case and we reviewed various um, improvements or changes to design or um, HVAC system or architecture um, that could improve one, the energy efficiency and the embodied carbon. Um, and it was a cross-sector collaboration between us, uh, Bennett's associates were involved as well, but also the structural engineers and most importantly, cost consultants, because at the end of the day, it will come down to cost. So with all those factors, you can kind of see what improvement measures you could do and what the cost of that will be and the impact on the, on the design. So building on that, we translated um, that process onto our project. And one of the key outcomes is one of these graphs, which I'll show you here. So you can see there's various iterations and various improvements, which you can implement into the, into the design and it shows a, a reduction in energy consumption. But to uh, rewind the clock a little bit, over here is the UK GBC advancing net zero performance targets. So what these are, are various energy use intensity targets for buildings to achieve within different time frames. Um, with the intent to get down to this magical 55 kilowatt hour per meter squared metric for the whole building um, in terms of energy consumption. And that is what's dubbed the Paris proof target, um, which means that to operate the building, um, it provides the right level of demand reduction such that the energy powering the building can be delivered by net zero um, uh, electricity effectively and energy. So this then also creates a split between landlord and tenant energy, which will you probably see more entering the market rather than a whole building energy consumption. It's starting to be split by what's under the landlord control, which is your whole building um, HVAC, your lifts and various pumping, and then the tenant items. So the on-floor lighting, um, IT and small power, your standard stuff that you see in an office that we all used to sit in. Um, we might be sitting in again sometime soon. Some of you maybe already are. Um, but what this is really then separating what is the developer's responsibility and what is the incoming tenant responsibility. Um, and so if you split it down into these two categories, there are only a certain, once you have a good design, there are only certain elements that the landlord can then implement. And one of the main things for this project was mixed mode. Um, because we had a sealed facade. So what we did is undertake a sort of a quick design study to see what the um, benefits in terms of energy consumption mixed mode could bring. So we have a single opening and a double opening. So the single opening is just a manually operable one strip. So if you remember the, if you cast your mind back at the facade, that grid structure, um, just one of the one of the squares in each uh, each bay was openable. Um, it does look; it's not fully curtain wall. Just out of uh, just a just a note, the glazing ratio actually or, uh, changed all around the facade and on height because the glazing ratio was optimized to be um, optimized based on the daylight and the solar gains. So 
a north facing facade was higher glazed than the south facing facade and the floors at the low level down the street where there was less solar ingress the, the glazing ratio could be increased to get that daylight through so it was a real holistic vision on the facade treatment but if we go back to the mixed mode uh, we have a single opening which is just um, manually operable by the by the um, tenants on the floor and the occupants and then the double opening where the high level um, op another high level opening was introduced which is automated so there was actuators behind that and an interlink between the HVAC and the window opening it also retained the manually operable window below to put op occupant control so the idea is this would be open far more for there's a great opportunity for the high level opening to be open rather than depending on the occupant control. And each of the windows are a set size and then just a 10 degree opening was uh, a restricted opening was, was provided. But we look at a slice through the floor plate and how much of the HVAC we could control, which would then inform how much energy saving we could do. Um, based on this two times height, which is I think from, a, from one of the SIBSI defaults, um, we could actually get a thousand meters squared um, service from, from natural ventilation. So this is the, the blue areas where we could do some mixed mode. Um, the red zones, it's determined probably won't be able to get enough natural ventilation through um, to do fully mixed mode. So the control within the red zone is for just normal operation based on mechanical vent. If we then went to the double opening, because it's quite a narrow floor plate, we can then pretty much get the entire floor plate served by natural ventilation and we could do um, a good level of, of energy reduction through mixed mode. Um, what we kind of determined is these red zones around the core were probably circulation zones and we could do uh, sort of scratch that bit from record. And so arguably we could do the whole floor plate um, naturally ventilated, which really increases that opportunity for, for mixed mode vent. So I'm just going to run through the modeling approach um, to get to the answers. The software we used was um, IES, uh, Virtual Environment, which is Integrated Environmental Solutions, um, which is the sort of dominant package in the industry for energy simulation. Um, main competitor to IES is TAS, but we use IES at Horley, which I think is uh, normally the case for many industry um, consultants. Um, if you're unfamiliar with IES, the way it operates is a number of modules that stand alongside each other to work towards and to inform the final result and simulation. So one of the main modules you use is called Apache HVAC, which allows us to do a detailed depiction of the energy of the um, HVAC system. So this is a graphical depiction down below. Um, basically what it means for each component, we can put in the actual engineering information, such as fan curves, pump curves, and for um, chillers or air source heat pumps, we can input temperature and load dependent COPs or efficiencies, which if you don't use this model, you have to use simplified methods, which is not going to give you a, a good depiction of um, of any reduction any reduction measures um, for the building. Um, so that gives us the HVSE modeling, and then you also use the MAC flow module, um, which gives us the window opening and the external airflow simulation. Um, I'll come back to why this is important on the next slide, but just to note that various different modules that you provide information, which then feed into the central simulation. Um, and the window opening was just simplified for this approach. We didn't go through to too much detail because it was just an initial study to see the impact. So it was very simple to say, well, based on internal and external temperatures during the summer months, um, the windows could be openable. Limitations, which I think everyone here would be keen on, um, which which yeah, it kind of informs how much, how much salt do you take for the final results or how big of a pinch of salt you take. Um, because it was a speculative office, we use default occupancy and internal gains profiles. Um, and for those in the know, there's a new standard that's come out called Neighbours UK, which provides um, defaults for speculative offices. Um, and coming back to the point about those modules. So if you remember we had 
Apache HVAC and then Macroflow, there is no interaction between those two modules. They feed into the central simulation, but they don't talk to each other. So what that means in our HVAC modeling, we can't write a control to say, if windows open, turn ventilation off because it doesn't know when the windows open because that's dealt by another module. So you have to kind of simplify things based on temperatures. Now, if they all are controlled on the same inputs, normally internal and external temperatures, it should marry up. However, there are scenarios where it doesn't quite work perfectly and you have to sort of simplify it and allow a bit of a margin, which perhaps is good because it doesn't give you as good of a benefit as what might be in practice. However, it could also go the other way. For the manually operable um, windows and just the single-sided windows, there was no intention for an interlink between the ventilation system and the window opening. So there was no sensor on the window to say, if windows open, turn ventilation off. Um, there was no allowance for that. So the best thing we could do is to use the CO2 sensors in the space, um, because in the baseline design, there is uh, demand control ventilation with CO2 sensors, um, and basically use that to say, well, if the CO2 concentration drops down to a significant level, the whole ventilation would, would turn off, um, which doesn't provide you an accurate answer because the windows could open at a certain concentration, which could be 800 parts per million, but the, CO2, the, the ventilation won't ramp down until the CO2 drops significantly down to you know, below 600. But that's the best we can do without window sensors. Um, another limitation and a key one is Macroflow uses simplified external airflow modeling. So at each orientation, at each level of the building, it will assume at each time set an external ventilation or air ingress into the, into this, into the floor plate, which may not be the case um, you know, when pressure may actually cause air to escape from the building, but that's how it is set up at the moment. Uh, another key issue is the idealized human behavior. That's something we can't model because we can't predict how humans will behave. So we just have to go through the ideal scenario to say, well, everyone in every floor plate and every bit of the building is very, um, very good at closing the windows at night and over weekends, which is not often the case. And there may be scenarios where windows could be opened, but occupants do not. But in this scenario, we just say someone has a, on every floor, someone has a superhuman strength to both sense the internal and the external temperature and open the windows. Uh, and another final impact, which is quite considerable, is internal blinds. Um, so if you refer back to those different modules and the fact that IES doesn't quite talk to each other, Here's another example where a blind, you could set the blinds to, to lower, which would re reduce the internal gains, but it will not reduce the amount of ventilation you'll get onto the floor plate. Now you can make an allowance for it, but it's, it's not simple. So what we did is actually say, well, let's just ignore blinds in this case. And if it does, get, um, if mixed mode does get included in the, into the building design, we'll have to do a more detailed review. Um, but for this, we just ignored. Then we looked at just to make sure it all makes sense. So this is our validation, just to look at the results. Um, and what you see here is on the sealed facade scenario, so no windows open, we have our heating load, cooling, and ventilation. And this is all energy consumed. So if there was a meter on the heating side of the air source heat pump and the cooling side and the HUs, how much energy they would produce. Um, and you can see this is, gives us the Doing the Apache HVAC detailed modeling gives us a bit more detail. So you can see the ventilation energy increasing as um, filters get dirty, um, which if you don't use that module, you won't be able to, to fully depict. Um, so when we then open up the windows and use the double opening, we see a, a significant reduction in the ventilation and most importantly, the cooling load. The reason we see quite a significant drop in this scenario in cooling load is because most of the cooling was dealt centrally because the design, the end of the, the developer's brief was a dehumidification strategy at the central plant. So quite a high volume of air is being 
cooled down to 14 degrees. So as soon as we can reduce that amount of air delivered to the floor plate through mixed mode, we are then also decreasing the amount of cooling load, which provides quite a significant benefit. If there wasn't the dehumidification strategy, I don't think we would see as much of a reduction in cooling, but we would see this reduction in ventilation. So what does that mean in terms of energy saving? The single opening that's sort of predicted to save 45,000 kilowatt hours per year, which if you look at whole buildings, is only 2% of the annual energy consumption, which you may say, is it worthwhile? Um, but cast your mind back to the split between landlord and tenant and what is the landlord in control of and the energy consumption that they are responsible for. If you focus on that, it increased to 5%, which is not insignificant. Um, of course, it's not going to be as good as the double opening, which provides a far more significant benefit at 4% for the whole building and 13% of your landlord energy. So it was a real consideration for the developer to include because they were ambitious. They wanted it to be a pioneering net zero carbon building. Um, so they were really looking to drive down their energy as much as possible or practical. However, it currently, it wasn't included in the design. So the current design being constructed does not have any openable windows. And the main reason for it is cost. It was a significant extra cost to include the openable windows. Um, not only the not only the increased capital cost, but also the operational expense for the servicing and maintenance they weren't initially keen on, particularly on the actuators and the sensors required to communicate between the HVAC and the, and the windows. Um, another limitation was the acoustic comfort and air quality. You remember it was not next to a railway line, so the acoustics weren't particularly amazing, um, nor was the air quality. However, it could improve in the future. Uh, and then finally, the increased embodied carbon, because including open windows meant more framing, which then increased the embodied carbon of the building. Um, and every decision on the building was made from a holistic point of view, both operational carbon and embodied carbon. So unfortunately, it wasn't included in the design. However, they are allowing for future adaptability. So in any case where acoustics or air quality get better, um, they are able to take away individual panels and install an opening window. So it's not an ideal example, but it is a good example of future adaptability, which we'll see more in the industry. Uh, I think that's it. Thank you for me. Thank, yeah. thank you very much, Owen. And uh, yeah, sorry to hear that such a such a smart design didn't get didn't find its way into the final um, yeah. into the final product. Um, We've got a couple of minutes um, for questions or comments. Oh, yeah, from Emma Gibbons, question for Owen, please. What consideration was given to ingress of ambient bracket outdoor air pollution in the building design? Uh, so the base design has significant amounts of filtration in the, air, in the air handling units and air quality is one of the main considerations, mainly because it was also going for a well certification which has indoor air quality criteria. When it came to evaluating the mixed mode, that was kind of not ignored, but it was just deemed not appropriate to consider at the time. Acknowledge that if this was to be implemented, we should probably look at the external um, air quality sensors to make sure the windows don't open where air quality is particularly bad. Um, but yeah, this was an idealized scenario just to see what the maximum energy saving could be. Thank you. Owen, do you think we're going to get more attention to, um, to servicing and maintenance in the future? Um, you, know, you mentioned that as one of the limitations. I'm just wondering now that people are becoming more aware of indoor air quality, whether that's something that may receive a bit more attention. Yeah, certainly. We would see it on this building because I just referenced it briefly. I won't go into too much detail, but there, there's a new standard that's come out called Neighbours UK, and that requires certification every year. Um, and it's based on your energy performance. And so that will increase and lead to increased driver on 
reviewing your systems, making sure it's operating as efficiently as possible. Mm -hmm. um, and so we are seeing developers write far more detailed specs to their facilities management team to make sure right. everything is operating as best as it could. Great, that's good to hear, thank you. I'm gonna sneak in one more from, uh, from Kate, the selling court. He says, um, wouldn't the cooling load have been cut a lot by reducing the solar gains? Do you model that option? Yeah, yes. So the solar gains were reduced as far as practical because it had to be a balance between um, daylight and solar gain. Um, so the the glazing ratio, I mentioned the glazing ratio varying around the facade. So it dropped down to about 40% on the south facade. Um, so that really reduced the amount of solar gain um, in the in the south portion of the building, but then opened up on the on the north facade. So it was managed with the intent for solar gain and cooling load to be lower than 100 watts per meter squared throughout the building. Hey, thank you. Um, it's time to move on now. Owen, thank you very much indeed. And thank you for stepping in um, at the last minute for your colleague. All right, um, thank you. Okay, we are, we are now halfway through this morning's session. We're running about 10 minutes behind uh, uh, schedule, but I will make sure that all, all speakers get the, get the allotted time. So I'm now delighted to, to introduce Dr. Leora malki Epstein, who's Associate Pref, uh, uh, Professor um, in Urban Fluid Mechanics and Air Quality at University College London, who's going to uh, 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 talk to us about some of the um, really important and exciting work she and her team have been doing on CO2 monitoring for managing indoor air quality. Um, and I will, I will let Leora introduce her work. Over to you, Leora. We can see your screen. Thanks, Martin. Can you hear me as well? Just about. Try it again. Uh, can you hear me now? You're a bit faint, actually. You may need a different. Microphone is probably better. Wonderful. Absolutely. OK. Yeah, great. Excellent. Thank you. Um, thanks, Malcolm, for uh, um, inviting me to uh, give a, a talk to this group. Um, and I have to thank you as well, because you were um, a very big and important part of this team of uh, CO2 monitoring, um, especially as the PI. So um, I will talk a bit about air quality today from the perspective of, uh, uh, of health of COVID, actually. Um, we have done quite a lot of work on COVID in the last 18 months and on looking at indoor air quality, particularly with, with that um, focus in mind and with that interest in mind. Um, this kind of work will be informative for um, managing infectious diseases, respiratory diseases in the future as well. Uh, and I think a, a lot of progress has been made actually in the last 18 months on this topic. So um, CO2 monitoring can be a really valuable tool here, here um, in this a specific subject and I will just talk about how it can be employed, what it does and doesn't measure and uh, describe a few projects I've been involved in. So uh, just uh, some project partners, uh, AirBods um, led by Malcolm Cook at Loughborough um, is intending to deliver guidance on ventilation operation and future design of non-domestic buildings and to quantify the risk of and reduce the transmission of SARS-CoV-2 in buildings. Um, with, with a number of excellent partners. Um, another UKRI funded project, um, Project Viral, which links very closely um, with uh, Project Track, the much bigger project led by uh, Kath Noakes. Um, and of course, um, with AirBuds, we've been working on the events research program over the past six months. And um, that in particular has looked at buildings as opposed to transport. So to start with, um, why are we monitoring CO2? It's uh, a good proxy for exhaled breath. Um, the main source of CO2 indoors is exhalation from occupants. And this kind of exhaled breath, it might accumulate in an indoor air because either because of poor ventilation um, that might be just poor for the space or because of high occupancy for the space, which may not have been designed um, it within in this phase of designing the ventilation system. Um, and that might be very temporary high occupancy. It might be a very transient area like the queue to the toilets, or it might be something that's consistently high over time. Um, sometimes both factors come together. And at that point, um, there is a higher risk of these kind of super spreading events that we've seen a few of in the literature 
when ventilation was particularly poor. Um, so the CO2 uh, concentration in the air gives us an indication of how much of the indoor air is actually made up of exhaled breath and, and how, how long has that exhaled breath been possibly accumulating there. Um, it all depends, of course, on the number of people in, in the space, um, their metabolic rate, their, their body uh, mass, uh, whether they're um, adults or children, male or female, and their background, and also on their activity. Um, the rate of removal is another issue um, that CO2 does that not actually get removed from the air unless it's ventilated with fresh outdoor air. Um, of course, for virus um, particles, there are many other removal mechanisms and CO2 will not actually um, give, correlate precisely to the virus because it doesn't get removed in the same way. So why is there a rationale for CO2 monitoring anyway? Um, I am putting here in bold letters, uh, CO2 does not equal SARS-CoV-2. It's really important to remember that. Um, to start with, of course, there could be a very densely occupied space with very poor ventilation and nobody would have SARS-CoV-2 in the space. So, of course, there's no risk at all. Um, the only cases we're concerned with and that probably preoccupy us when we um, go around crowded places is that we don't really, as humans, want to be infected by accident from people we don't know just because we happen to share the same air with them for a while. Um, and it, it was several months of debate um, with the World Health Organization before they really recognized that to start with inhalation was most likely the dominant transmission route. Um, and also that aerosols in particular are actually can carry the virus and can accumulate indoors to a point where, although it seems to uh, medical scientists very often that it's only a very, very small amount or that the particles are very small, but at high doses, this does um, build up and does accumulate and increase risk of infection. So certainly wearing a face covering is really important. It does help reduce transmission and there's a lot of evidence of this. Um, it's important to remember with CO2 monitoring, CO2 still passes through even the best possible, uh, highest quality face covering like a FFP3 one shown on this, uh, in this picture, um, but the virus wouldn't. So again, if everyone is wearing face coverings, CO2 would not correlate um, again. Um, despite that, it does really help um, just mitigate the risk. It helps identify places that are not very well ventilated. It also focuses our attention on the location we're in, the environment created by the space we're in, and the environment created by both the fact that there, the space might be better or, or worse in terms of ventilation, um, and in terms of uh, how many people are in the space itself. So uh, some previous projects before we started looking at buildings, um, the viral program, we were looking at buses quite a lot and doing our own uh, measurements on, on our own bus as well. Um, we, we've certainly um, managed to convince, um, in that sense, Transport for London that opening windows um, really did sufficiently increase ventilation in a really wide range of scenarios. It basically guarantees having enough fresh air on any bus. So following this advice, they um, added these instruction stickers to all the windows across the fleet, um, advising passengers to leave the windows open. They've also um, completely modified the ventilation systems to create a separate one for the bus drivers uh, in order to protect them because their exposure was obviously um, more significant as they were the, on the bus for longer every day. Um, we also looked at, uh, besides bus drivers, we also looked at workers on municipal waste collection vehicles. Um, and once again, an agenda that um, has been very uh, common in the built environment and, and in buildings, energy saving has been king for many years. It has dominated the agenda, um, resulting in really airtight indoor spaces. And that has had a knock-on effect on air quality um, across the board. And this is true for vehicles as well. Um, possibly even um, vehicles, the vehicle industry doesn't have the same standards of ventilation or groups of experts that the building industry does. Um, so there's a certainly amount, um, some work to do there. Um, so looking back at buildings, the events research program, which I'll talk about um, next, is, uh, has a lot, given us a really unparalleled opportunity to jump into a bunch of uh, very interesting buildings and um, do CO2 monitoring at, uh, at a large scale. Uh, we are able to quantify 
um, the quality of ventilation across uh, a large number of public buildings in the UK. Uh, the UK building stock um, has not been evaluated closely enough in terms of post-occupancy evaluation. And certainly with the events are held in uh, public places, places occupied by many, many different people quite often, um, sometimes at the same time, sometimes just day after day. And it's important to understand what kind of um, air quality they present. So understanding how air quality can be improved has been, um, is an issue that is not necessarily well understood um, outside of uh, the, the groups of experts that come to events like today's. Um, but uh, we are, everyone, uh, including everyone on this call, is working to increase this kind of awareness, not only that ventilation is important, but how do you actually achieve it and how do you achieve it in an effective way. And CO2 monitoring as an inexpensive uh, method is actually very, very helpful here in raising that awareness and understanding. So um, if I start talking about the events research program, um, the AirBuds project has been um, really uh, devoted uh, for several months to look at the events research program and in particular research teams from UCL, from Loughborough University and from the University of Sheffield um, with Abigail Hathaway um, ha have been uh, going out and measuring in, in a large number of um, indoor uh, venues. So to give you a kind of a sense of how this looks, um, we had uh, CO2 loggers, we had 350 of these CO2 loggers that can communicate online um, and transmit information every two minutes through a gateway to a central database. Um, that allowed us to deploy very, very quickly and to analyze the results um, quite quickly con considering the amount of data that was collected. Uh, we went to every venue and some of them were very big. Some of them were very big sports um, venues like the Royal Ascot or Wembley Stadium. And certainly you would think of these as primarily an outdoor activity, but actually these places have um, a very large number of indoor spaces. And it was really important to understand that the, um, the customer journey through a, a venue like this includes uh, outdoor uh, time as well as indoor time. And in the indoor time was something that was not really well understood. So we did um, go to every venue like this and subdivide it into uh, as many spaces as reasonably practical that we could um, keep track of basically, uh, mapped all of those zones out and in every single space um, placed several sensors. Um, so for example, if we think of um, uh, the download uh, festival where Malcolm's team were uh, monitoring, there were uh, close to 20 sensors around a single tent. So um, it's really trying to capture at a great resolution what has been happening in the space and not just putting one CO2 monitor, which can give them um, either false reassurance or actually falsely create an alarm situation as well. So, um, 10 outdoor, outdoor and indoor venues were looked at by the program across the board in total. Um, at each of those, we deployed between 30 or 50 or 75 CO2 monitors at a time. Um, the monitors measured CO2 temperature and humidity. The temperature and humidity data, I'm sure, will be interesting uh, for analysis for years to come, but the CO2 is really our focus in terms of COVID. Um, this really allowed us to develop this detailed understanding of how the air was distributed um, throughout uh, large auditorium spaces, throughout restaurants, throughout bars and concessions and uh, corridors and, and even the outdoor spaces themselves, including partly sheltered outdoor spaces like these marquees shown in the picture, um, and just really understand what actually happens at events and where do people spend their time. Uh, we monitored in total, I think it was um, 55 events in total. So uh, at each of those events, we identified a number of zones ranging from two to 31, depending on the size of the venue. Um, and these ran across from the uh, phase one of the events research program that happened still under phase two of the government restrictions. So most people were still at home at that point, um, or back in mid, April um, onto phase two, which began in May and phase three, which began in June. 
Um, and in total, we looked at 179 different spaces with uh, music, culture, and uh, sports. Uh, we classified all of these um, spaces using um, typical architectural terms um, based on how they're being used, um, architectural as well as venue management. So this required quite a lot of conversation with everyone um, running events. Uh, and we also looked at the ventilation schemes that were being employed and those varied quite widely across the venues. Um, the way the spaces were used had a really big uh, impact on the air quality in the spaces. Um, the size of the spaces, the number of people in them, and how they were ventilated all had an impact. And with a large database like this, we, we will be able to draw conclusions such as um, toilets as a whole tended to be worse in terms of ventilation. Uh, queues and corridors leading to toilets tended to be this kind of pinch point where um, oddly enough, because of COVID restrictions, people tended to spend a much longer queuing in the, uh, for the toilet and always in corridors that were not designed for ventilation at a high occupancy because there's supposed to be a trans transient space. So it was important to understand all of these different factors and using intensive high resolution CO2 monitoring allowed us to understand all of this. Um, I've shown this. Um, in terms of methods, we also wanted to move a bit beyond the pre-pandemic classifications of indoor air quality that were based on CO2 for comfort and thermal comfort or occupant comfort, um, and actually increase the resolution of those to have um, six air quality bands. And what this allows us to do is to understand really what kind of spaces um, are almost ventilated to outdoor levels um, and, and are really very, have uh, very high levels of, of fresh air ingress and which of them are kind of medium quality and can safely have uh, certain numbers of people in them and which of them have just ended up in a state where either through too, uh, occupancy that's too high or ventilation that's too poor um, ended up really as a priority for improvement. Um, and uh, Sage EMG recommended that the spaces that are showing CO2 levels above 1500 are a priority for improvement. So rather than trying to make every indoor space um, have CO2 values that are classed as A or B or C um, and, and unnecessarily making people very cold and uncomfortable and subject to other health problems, um, for, for a long time, it's actually to focus simply on the ones that are presenting the worst air quality, um, because those are the ones that are most likely to have the risk of potentially um, spreading events. Um, so, and, and of course, if any infectious diseases emerged in the future that were either less or more infectious, we could also adapt the, uh, our understanding of which bands of ventilation air quality we're looking at uh, to achieve. So um, just an example from a music festival that was held um, in an indoor theater um, surrounded by many outdoor spaces. Um, and to show you the difference between average values and maximum values. And that was very important in terms of our methods to understand that with the CO2 monitors, um, you want to have several loggers in each space. You then want to average all of them and understand in general, what air quality is being achieved, but you also want to pick up on those particular loggers that are placed in a place where maybe there's no airflow, maybe the ventilation isn't reaching and the air is stagnating. And those maximum values are also quite important. Uh, what's even more important is then to look at the maximum values and understand, um, is this just something that happened for 10 minutes as lots of people were walking through and then um, cease to be a problem, or is it a persistent um, issue where um, the decay of CO2 is actually showing us that there's not enough fresh air or the ventilation system is, is faulty? Or is it that people were crowding indoors for two hours drinking in a, in a particular bar and, and, and um, for, for a very long time exposed to these maximum values? So the, the way the monitoring is carried out really helps um, understand the full picture of all this. Um, so in a festival like this, um, the attendees were spending half of their time actually outdoors and the rest of their time indoors in spaces that were mainly very, very well ventilated. Um, all the public space, uh, spaces were. 
Um, at large sports venues, again, it, it depends. So peak values could be much higher in some places and sometimes persist even for well over an hour. Um, so what we're really seeing is that indoor settings, they're not necessarily risky. The risk depends on many, many factors. It really depends on how long people spend in the place, um, the ventilation of the place, and very, very much so on crowd numbers and crowd densities. And personal risk for people can really vary dramatically based on those factors. And the behavior of people is really important to remember as well, uh, which is not our expertise, but it certainly uh, has been shown in a number of settings that behavior is really important. Um, I know I'm running out of time. Yeah. Um, I'm just going to show briefly um, some results from Abigail's um, monitoring of the crucible in phase one that showed both, you can see the actual time series, which I haven't shown you so far, um, what happens when you have 30 monitors, each of them is colored in a different uh, color. You can see the spread and the variation uh, of what they're monitoring um, that, that can change by 400 ppm. Um, and also the impact of crowds. You can see exactly when the crowd is in the auditorium and when they've left. And you can also see how um, to the very left, there are crowds of 150 people. And to the very um, right side, there are 850 people. So the impact of numbers. Um, so there have been uh, many lessons learned from the ERP. Um, they have actually been summarized in the SAGE paper on application of CO2 monitoring as an approach to managing ventilation. I've put a link here, um, and I think I'll stop talking now so, to allow people to ask uh, questions, but this will be in the, um, in the presentations. Wonderful. Thank you, Leora, for a, a very data rich uh, presentation. And can I encourage delegates to look back at the presentation because there's lots of useful stuff, especially in those last two slides there. Um, we, we have a real pertinent question um, in the chat from, and forgive me if, I've, if I mispronounce your name, Diamond PE. Uh, and the question is why measure CO2 only when COVID 19 and traffic air pollution? PM 2.5 are particles. Should particle monitoring also be used? That, that's a really important question. Um, particle monitoring is just so much more expensive than using CO2 monitors. And the, the monitors that can send you the data um, automatically don't exist either. So the, the difference is between a logger that might cost 300 pounds to a logger that would cost several thousand pounds. Um, that's simply the reason. So you, you, we did actually measure PM 2.5 in the different venues. We haven't yet had time to analyze the data, um, but it would just wouldn't, and it wouldn't correlate to exhaled breath. We wouldn't know whether we're measuring virus or pollution particles or dust, um, and it wouldn't be as informative. But with CO2, we understand um, directly how well the ventilation system is working and how the air is dis the fresh air is distributed around the venue. And that's the element we're most interested in, um, the exhaled breath from people. But of course it wouldn't, uh, if, if collecting samples, uh, I should say in phase one, uh, Lena Sirik from uh, UCL collected air samples and analyzed them for bacteria as well. Um, didn't find uh, SARS-CoV-2 in the air and was able to show that um, crowded places had higher bacterial counts than non-crowded places. Thank you, Leora, uh, and thank you for the question. Um, we're gonna move on now, but uh, Leora, yeah, uh, thank you very much for your presentation. I know just how busy uh, you are managing all, all, all of these various demands on your time. So I'm very grateful for you stepping in and, and, and talking about that important program. Thank you. Um, we're now going to move on to Simon Parker from the Defence Science and, and Technology Lab Laboratory, who's going to uh, talk about, as, as it says on the screen here, quantifying indoor exposure to outdoor uh, particles. Simon, thank you for joining us. Uh, hand over to you now. Thanks, Malcolm. Um, and uh, yeah, thanks for, for your time um, today. I'm, I'm going to talk about something that is um, a little bit different from what we've heard so far this morning, um, but I, I think talks to this through the same topic, which is really about understanding indoor exposure um, to outdoor particles. So hopefully you can all see all see my slides. Um, and I, I'm gonna get into some of the theory that we use to try and make, make sense of what's really quite a complicated problem. Um, and, uh, and, 
and bring it back to some to some data as well, which is which is some historical data, but but data that that uh, tries to to um, talks a little bit to, to some of these issues, albeit for for quite different problems. So I, I'll just introduce my particular interests and our, our interests at DSTL, which are, are not coming from perhaps the same um, position in terms of thinking about uh, exposure to environmental particles. Um, but we are interested in exposure to, to particles that might come from, from outside a building. So really, th this is our interest. It's, it's, um, we, worry, we worry about infrastructure and buildings in particular, um, as well as transport infrastructure. But um, it, here I'm going to talk about buildings and, and where they might be a, a target for, um, for, for some kind of nefarious activity, say a terrorist attack on a building. And we, and we know that buildings and crowded spaces have been targeted in the past. The image on the on the right is um, an image from um, a, a failed attack in, in Tokyo from on Shimiko Court back in um, 1993, where they, they tried to release um, uh, a biological agent, um, Bacillus anthracis, from uh, an aerosolized release on top of a building that, that was really targeting a, a wide area of a city. And the, the intention was um, was most likely to target occupants in buildings as well as potentially those at, at street level, but it was it was a high level release. And those are the kind of things we worry about. How, how might that material get into a building? And what does that mean for, for people indoors? We, we also worry about releases directly inside buildings as well. But, but this question about the link between outdoors and indoors is something that um, it, it, it's something that we, we try and understand uh, in, in a slightly different context from the environmental question, which is which tends to be more about the, the kind of longer term exposure to perhaps continuous or intermittent sources from, from outdoors. And we're really interested in exposure to shorter term, deliberate or, or accidental releases. And I think we overlap a little bit there with um, some of the interests from um, those who are interested in industrial safety. Um, so those releases might be indoors or outdoors, and they might be gas phase, or they might be in the aerosol phase, there might be particles, um, and, and, and I'm going to talk about really about about particles um, here today. And we worry about different kind of buildings, but really the, the main thing we're we're most concerned about is, is non-residential buildings, um, typically large buildings because because they may be a target. But we we also care about residential buildings and understanding what that might mean in terms of the, the protection that a building provides the occupants um, from whatever's happening outside. So that's really where, where I'm coming from. And that, that, that you see there's quite a lot of overlap there with, with the kind of environmental questions we're concerned about. Having said all of that, I spent my last 18 months thinking about, about COVID, working with, with Kath and Leora, Leora and, and lots of others on, on these questions. Um, so it, it, it's kind of nice to, to take a look back at, at some of this, um, some of these questions. So the kind of methods we use really depends on the question we're, we're, we're trying to answer, but we, we, make use of, we make use of experiments from tracer dispersion, scale modeling and environmental measurements to understand environments and understand how uh, transient um, releases might impact on building interiors um, and how that changes over time. Those are notoriously difficult to do and they're expensive. Um, and, and they tell us about one specific case. And often the kind of questions we get are more general than, than asking about a specific case. And we, we rarely have the opportunity to study a building in advance. Um, so we make a lot of use of models and we use a whole range of levels of fidelity from really high resolution LES CFD and um, RAN CFD through to compartmental models with single zones and, and multi zones, kind of network models that, that others will be familiar with for, for ventilation um, studies, but we use them to, to look at airflow, but also contaminant transport. Um, and and we've, done, we've done some work in DSTL building on some of those network models where we're specifically looking at um, uh, the, the contaminant transport side of that. Um, and I'm gonna talk to you through some of that because, um, because of some of the implications of it in terms of thinking about how, how we think about simplifying some of those problems. Um, and we also use a, a range of other techniques like eddy diffusion models where we can't really, we don't really have all the information we need for a full CFD model, but we might want to understand something about spatial variation in, in, internally. 
So um, I, I, I'll speed up a bit, but what, what we do with network models, um, typically they, 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 they do two things. They solve the airflow for us and then do the contaminant transport. And what we do is we, we, we use them to solve the airflow and then we, we take that and, um, and then branch off and do the contaminant transport ourselves. So we, we wrap up the, the really the, 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 the zones and their connectivity and their volumes and the airflows between them. And we say, okay, what about if we, if we hold that steady? What, what does that mean then for the contaminant transport? And we recast that in a in a in a matrix equation on the right there, um, using this 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 kind of like standard standard form for um, uh, that, that's that's used in, in a range of engineering applications. But we're applying it here to look at concentrations in the zone. So our x here is a is a vector of concentrations in the zones, um, and we're looking at the the um, really a system of, of ODEs there to, to look at the effect of ventilation and other losses like losses that are important for particles um, and then sources so whether that source is inside the building or, or outside the building. So we, we've used that then to, to look at a range of questions things like how interconnected is the, are the spaces within the building so in this case we're just thinking about releases inside a building um, and at the top here we've got three different building types of res simple residential um, model of a building, um, an apartment, uh, a, six a six floor apartment building, um, and, and, and a, a much more complicated um, hospital healthcare building over three floors. And we, we use these um, developed a way of mapping really the, the, uh, the exposure in different locations in that building relative to where, the, where a release is. If we only have a release in one location, how does that affect the rest of the building? And there's two ways of interpreting these. These are quantitative, but you can think of them as what's the steady state concentration that you'd get if you had a continuous release in one location. Um, and you can then build those up if you want multiple sources, for example. But it also tells us about the exposure if there's a finite release. And more often for us, that's what we're interested in. Um, a particular mass of materials released over a short time. And then what, what does that look like in terms of people's people's exposure um, uh, 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 over a period of time. Um, and, and those maps, they, they look, look like a jumble at first, but once you get used to them, you can pick out information. So how does the material move between floors or within zones on the same floor? How does the ventilation system determine that, that influence? So in the one on the right, although there's three floors, there's two air handling systems, and that's really determining the exposure in that building. We, we, we know when we use these kind of models that actually exposure really does vary um, within a building. If we think about an outdoor um, concentration that impacts on, on the building, in this case, we've got three different buildings and the blue lines are, are, are modeled concentrations um, when we've got a one hour uh, uh, um, release of, of a high concentration outside of the building. And in some of these cases, we see really wide variation compared to what a single zone in this dashed line would tell us. In other cases where there is some ventilation and mixing within the building, actually they collapse onto, pretty much onto one. Um, and, and the structure of the building is important to, um, if there are dis certain discrete zones that are less well ventilated, we see a really big range in concentrations. So we, we, it kind of led us on to, to looking at some simplification. So, if we wanted to think about, if we want to think about health effects related um, to, to these different kinds of releases and outdoor releases, we see that we can write down some analytical expressions um, and we can relate the, um, the exposure in each indoor zone to a sum really of, of three different components. The, in, the initial indoor concentrations, how they're affected by the ventilation, the external concentration and, and, and the exposure outdoors. It, it, if you integrate that over time for a short-term release, how much how much pollution or contaminants do people have the potential to be exposed to? Um, and and then the the mass is released inside the building. And, and when we do that, we can show that actually we can we can take some shortcuts in some cases and see that see the 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 limiting exposures by which I'm I'm talking about if you stay in that space for long enough. Um, those, those, although those concentrations look very different for a short or, or, a, or a slightly longer release, actually these exposures tend to the same value. Um, and we can relate internal exposures to external exposures as well. And that becomes really important when we're thinking about buildings um, and we don't necessarily know all the detail. We don't know enough to model it in advance. 
but we can think then about what protection does a building offer the the occupants um, and we can take into account things like losses of particles due to their penetration into the into the building envelope so there might be lost uh, as they as they pass into um, it through through different openings um, or or they're deposited once they're inside the building um, and and active filtration of course can can remove those those particles um, we might also think about uh, inactivation of, of biological materials as well because the, because they don't survive very long in the air um, for example might be another re removal mechanism so we've done that um, we've used these kind of methods then to look at um, a, a a whole range of buildings um, where we create those models and then here in this plot we plot the the indoor exposure relative to the outdoor exposure so uh, one you're getting the same exposure as outside zero you're not getting any and each point here is a different building from a set of ready created multi-zone buildings so we've got uh, attached and detached houses and apartment buildings and some sort of manufactured houses down the, down the bottom right some mobile homes if you like um, and and the, the range here is the range of the zones inside the building. Um, and, and what we've done here is done this for, for two micrometer particles and looked at that relative exposure. And you get a really wide range there, but it turns out these ones down the bottom are, are buildings where the models have some um, filtration involved and some internal ventilation. Um, whereas the ones on the right hand side are, are ones where it's really just affected by building structure and deposition. Um, and we see that, that those kind of ranges fall within some of the measured values for um, this, this ratio when we look at PM 2.5 in, in US residential buildings. So some kind of agreement there, but we'd really like to have better data to validate against. So um, I'll, I'll just touch on, on this before I wrap up then. So we've, we've looked back at, at what, what is there in the, in the, in the literature going back, going back quite a way. And, really that's because we've not found anything of the scale that we're interested in um, more recently um, and you have to go right back to the 50s when um, when governments were worried about uh, um, they were worried about nuclear war they were worried about um, they were worried about the effect of radiological particles being being drawn into buildings and what effect buildings might have on protecting protecting people um, and they did some really large-scale experiments that, that would never be done again, I think, because of the some of the materials they use. And there's certainly questions raised about some of these tracer materials. And if you're interested, you can go back and look at some of the reviews that were that were carried out more recently um, into, into why those uh, why those trials were done and what impact they had on human health. But the fact that they were done and the fact that data is is out there and available, I think leads us to think we should we should look at that and we should use it if it if it can tell us something about protecting protecting people so what they've used here is um very well defined particles of zinc cadmium sulfide with most of those particles between one and three micrometers and releases um in in an urban area in the u.s um at, at, at different locations and then they've measured um, concentrations, integrated concentrations in a range of buildings as well as outdoors. So this plot shows a, just one example, one field test um, with a code here, a release location, the, the wind is, is, is from right to left, and these points are measurement locations, and these, these contour plots are, are just drawn on top to, to join those up. Um, and what what we see is, is m these values written alongside, and we gone through these and some of the tabulated data and drawn some of them out where, where we're where where there's also data on ingress into buildings so in this case we've got some buildings here labeled on this on this image um, and what I'll show you very quickly is, is just some of the some of the uh, some of the exposure values that, that were reported so here's for a school it's a it's two or three story school and for each trial we plotted all of the indoor dosage re dosages reported and all of the outdoor dosages reported and then the average of those and and that gives us some measure of, of this infiltration factor the ratio of the indoor to outdoor exposure um, the, the ratio of the integrated concentrations indoors to outdoors there were some limitations the sampling duration was not as long as we would like indoors so these might be underestimates but you can see they do tend to cluster um, and give us some estimate of, of the reduction in exposure indoors, presumably because of this penetration practice being 
below one and deposition rates indoors. We see something similar for, for houses, these are residential houses, um, and we see a range of values and it depends on the structure, whether they're wooden or stucco construction and the, and the low wind speed or the high wind speed. Low wind speed means much longer before that's flushed out indoors and maybe the sampling here is, is low as well, but we see more variability under low wet wind speed than high wind speed. Um, and there's also some data there for large buildings, tall buildings. So this is a this is a 10 story building, some measurements at different heights across the building, and then some measurements inside. And then, and you can see that uh, at ground level, um, actually, that, that there's, there's all of that exposure is received in the first 45 minutes. And as you go up to heights, it's, it's, it's remaining into the, into the second sampling period, which goes out to 90 minutes. So again, we, we can see some reduction inside. It's perhaps not as great as you might think though. Okay, conscious that I'm, I'm out of time. So um, really the conclusions from our point of view, um, where we're thinking about health effects from potentially um, uh, very hazardous materials, integrated concentrations are really useful um, for, for thinking about exposures for short-term releases. Um, they normalize out a lot of the variability um, and you can show from um, some of these analytical approaches that, that that's, that's a reasonable starting point. They vary within the building for a given um, outdoor release, those ratios vary as well. Um, historical data, we're going back a long way and there's a lot of limitations, but it is extremely valuable for getting some insight into, into what's happening. We'd really like to have much more recent data though, for, for much more recent building construction as well. Um, pattern of dispersion and infiltration in the buildings varies very much between experiments. Um, that, I haven't shown that here, but we see that when we look back at some of this data. And those infiltration factors do depend on, on multiple um, details of what's happening, both in terms of the building construction, the meteorology operation and, and, and the timing too. So just taking a step back and thinking about research questions from, from our perspective, um, we don't really see, we don't feel that there's enough um, uh, on, on exposure due to transient releases. Um, understandably, the focus is on longer term more, more often. Um, particle size dependent behavior, that's one reason we went back to this historical data, it's very well controlled there. We like to understand um, behavior of a much wider range of sizes. Talked about, talked about some of these, these effects. Um, the roles of surfaces, contact and resuspension when you have real people in buildings. Um, and we've seen that across with COVID that, that some of these features become important and, and, and occupant behavior. I think some of the speakers have already talked about that. That's, it, it's really key. And, and as modelers, we find that difficult to deal with. I think we need to be talking more to behavioral scientists more routinely to, to deal with much of that. Um, and it would be great to see, it's great to see what the, the kind of data Lior is able to present with CO2 data. I'd really like to see more resolved data for, for particle measurements too, um, now that we've got lower cost sensors. Um, but we need to keep in mind sampling considerations and the difficulty in doing that for aerosol, aerosol particles. Um, and and my, the thing that always is missing for me when I see time series is they never go out long enough really to understand exposure over, over long time periods too. So, that's a, that's a plea for more experimental data over, over longer periods. Um, I'll, I'll leave it there and um, happy to answer any, any questions um, that anyone has. Thank you very much, Simon. That's great. And, and um, very neatly uh, complements um, other things we've been listening to this morning. Um, so I think that there's a question in the chat there. Would you suggest supply air filtration as an intervention for city air pollution, PM1 or PM2.5 particles? I, I, I'm not sure that I'm in a good position to, um, to, to answer that because I don't spend much of my time thinking about yeah. design of buildings. But I, I think, I think it, is, it is clear that, um, that, that those smaller particles do penetrate buildings if, unless there's deliberate, um, deliberate efforts made to remove them and it, in that size range other loss mechanisms like deposition really aren't aren't as strong and I think I think yeah it's it once you look at some of that data where you have filtration um, included whether it's on the supply side or whether it's in in space filtration or recirculating filtration I think it does make a big difference to to exposure from the kind of modeling we've we've looked at. 
Thank you. Uh, um, perhaps a little unfair for me to pose that question to you because it's a question to everybody, but thank you for a view on that. Um, I don't think I've got any hands up at the moment. So if that's the case, I'll just ask a question about, um, so uh, in your conclusions, uh, um, you know, obviously uh, um, indoor exposure depends on building type and, 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 and fabric and construction and that type of thing. So are we, are we still in that position of, as we build our buildings tighter and tighter, that, that, that there's a, there's a danger of, um, of exposure getting greater, or actually are we protecting ourselves more and more from, from that? And we're more in danger of um, transmission of, of pollutants from, from indoors. Yeah, that's a, that's a good question, Malcolm. And I think, I think it's really, it's come back to the, the, the perhaps the, the kind of modelers, um, perspective which is it always depends on the scenario that you're that you're you're thinking about and um yeah i think those both of those scenarios something on a much bigger scale that that, that might affect a wider urban area over over um many buildings then air tightness kind of protects those occupants where you've got some other removal rate um at, at, and, and and that makes a lot of sense and i think that yeah i think the the downside is if there's something inside the building whether that's whether that's the kind of things we worry about or you know in in a in a lobby or in you know somewhere that's publicly accessible or whether that's whether that's covid and um thinking about um other other materials that where yeah because of air tightness the ventilation rate is is lower um then yeah i think that they're, they're they're effectively trade-offs in, in that sense thank you very much simon Thank you very much for your time. Okay, we'll move on to our final uh, uh, presentation of this morning. And just to say, we, we aim to finish uh, just after 12.30 and we'll give you 45 minutes break. So we'll start, uh, we'll start at 1.15 for the afternoon session. Um, so for our final presentation, I'm, I'm, I'm delighted to welcome uh, Dr. Thomas Schroepfer from, from Singapore. Thank you for, for staying um, up into the early evening. Um, Thomas is Professor and Founding Associate Head of the Architecture and Sustainable Design Pillar at the Singapore University of Technology and, and Design. And I've asked uh, uh, Thomas to talk a little bit about uh, um, horizon gazing, looking to the future, thinking about what's possible in terms of urban planning. Um, so you know, really bringing, bringing things together and looking to the future in terms of this this complex urban environment that we're all involved in, in, in some way, shape or form. So Thomas, thank you very much for joining us. Uh, I'm gonna hand over to you now. Can you see my presentation? Yes, I can. Yep. Okay, That's very good, very good. Uh, thank you for the kind introduction, Malcolm, and uh, of course for having me. So uh, hello from Singapore. Good evening, in fact, from Singapore. It's just getting dark here. Uh, the title of my presentation today is Dense and Green Cities, Architecture as Urban Ecosystem, and it refers to work that we have done with the Future Cities Lab here in Singapore over the past couple of years. Innovative building projects in high density urban environments show that density and sustainability are not necessarily contradictory. In fact, they can be mutually dependent and synergistic. In the following short presentation, I will introduce to you an ongoing research project at the Singapore ETH Center and the Singapore University of Technology and Design. The project studies exemplary urban developments to illustrate the interaction between buildings and the city as ecological systems and the many design, environmental, social and economic benefits the resulting dense and green city offers. Let me start by providing you with a short overview of the context of our work. The Future Cities Lab, or FCL, was established by ETH Zurich and the National Research Foundation Singapore in collaboration with key academic partners, including the Singapore University of Technology and Design in 2010, to study sustainable future cities through science, by design and in place. FCL's agenda is the development of new integrated planning paradigms, research methodologies, and implementation processes 
to support higher population densities, higher standards of environmental sustainability and enhanced livability. In this context, our research explores buildings in high density urban contexts that include public and common spaces, extensive sky terraces, sky bridges, vertical parks, roof gardens, and other green components. Combinations of all these often apply to mixes of residential, civic, and commercial programs, conjoin at times to produce vertical cities in which the building section becomes what the horizontal plane has entailed up to now. So over the past six years, we have studied a large number of such projects with a focus on uh, Singapore. And here, just to provide you with uh, a visual, uh, this is actually the Future Cities Lab on the campus for research excellence and technological enterprise in Singapore, where most of the research that I will be referring to today has been conducted. If you're interested in finding out more about FCL and our work, not just about my project, uh, please refer to our website that is seen here on the left. We are also about to publish in BCR3, a book that summarizes the results of all FCL projects from 2015 and to 2020. For quite some time now, Singapore has been a leader in dense and green cities in Southeast Asia. As the country's population continues to grow and with limited land available, developing a compact city with extensive greenery and highly livable environments continues to be an important strategy. Singapore offers a broad range of important developments for our research. The information at hand and knowledge gleaned from these can enable similar developments in other cities. This can help to improve urban environments there as well, steering the what we call the dense and green paradigm from its current status to an integrated and passive element of the planning and design of future sustainable cities in general. The slide here shows you an aerial view of Singapore's Marina Bay with gardens by the bay in the foreground. Here you see the cover of the architecture and urbanism special issue from 2012 titled Singapore Capital City for Vertical Green. The publication features contributions by many of the important dense and green stakeholders in Singapore, including government agencies, developers, architects, and landscape architects. Here, I quickly want to show you uh, the covers of two book publications that summarize important findings of our work at FCL. Uh, on the left, Dense and Green, Innovative uh, Building Types for Sustainable Urban Architecture from 2016. And on the right, Dense and Green Cities, Architecture as Urban Ecosystem, our latest book that was published uh, in early 2020. The idea of combining architecture and nature at a large scale is, of course, not a new one, but dates back thousands of years. On the slide, you see the Hanging Gardens of Babylon in a colored engraving from the 19th century. Considered one of the seven wonders of the ancient world, the Hanging Gardens most likely was a large terrace structure with a series of gardens on multiple levels containing a wide range of greenery. One can interpret this building as an early example of a dense and green development. If we fast forward to the more recent past, an important moment in the evolution of the dense and green paradigm is certainly the Netherlands Pavilion at the Expo 2000 in Hanover by MBRDV. The building is shown here in section and in elevation, and the pavilion has largely been considered the Expo's most successful in responding to its themes which were man, nature, and technology. Events programming stressed the capacity for design to mediate a balance between those three entities through exploring the best practices for global human coexistence. MBRDV's interpretation of the past consisted of a densely stacked, airy green building comprising six levels and exhibition features that signify distinct ecosystems of the Dutch landscape. Here you see a photograph taken from one of the elevated levels of the, of the pavilion showing nature as a major component of the building structure. In the context of Singapore, projects like Boha School of the Arts completed in 2010 and Park Royale on Pickering completed in 2013 have led the way in establishing the dense and green paradigm in the urban planning and design discourse of the city. 
On the slide, you see an aerial view of the School of the Arts with its, its, its extensive common roof garden and large green uh, facades. Here you see Park Royale on Pickering, the second project I just mentioned in elevation. The photograph shows the architecture includes green spaces on multiple levels of the building. The overall result in this case is a doubling of the green space of the adjacent public park in the vertical dimension. Here uh, you see the same building again, an aerial view uh, showing the sky gardens uh, from, from above. Based on such projects, architects in Singapore have speculated about what a future high density urban environment might look like. One example by the same firm is this rendering titled Permeable Lattice City of the Future from the year 2011. It shows a building in the scale of an entire city with integrated green spaces, as well as public programs on many of the elevated levels. In terms of policies and regulations that have provided incentives for developers and designers to pursue the dense and green city, the landscaping for urban spaces and high rises or LUSH scheme is a very important one. LUSH is a comprehensive urban and sky rise greening program comprising both landscape replacement area requirements and incentives to provide greenery and communal spaces on many levels. LUSH was introduced in 2009 as a consolidated urban and sky rise greening scheme comprising incentives and requirements. It capitalizes on development as a means to inject more greenery into the city in general. The premise is actually quite simple. Replace the greenery which has been taken away as a building is developed or redeveloped. Since its introduction, Lush has actually been updated multiple times and the current version is 3.0. I will now share with you three built examples that illustrate the dense and green paradigm in Singapore. The first one, the interlace designed by OMA, Bureau Ole Sharon and RSB architects, planners and engineers completed in 2015, is a private housing development with uh, just over 1000 units and a gross floor area of 170,000 square meters. The exploded isometric on the right, actually on the left, uh, shows the extensive integration of green spaces on many levels of the building. The next building I'm gonna share with you is uh, Group 8 Asia's Aeda's Pungol Waterway Terraces 1 from the year 2015 as well. Uh, the project is actually a public housing development, also just over a thousand units and a gross floor area of 146,000 square meters. So this is a very typical size for residential developments in Singapore uh, nowadays. Here you see uh, the so-called jungle gardens of this project, uh, which is essentially the green integration in one of the uh, three main courtyards of the building. Designed by Boha and awarded World Architecture Festival Building of the Year in 2018, Kampung Admiralty is Singapore's first integrated public development that brings together a mix of public facilities and services under one roof. The project includes a large community plaza and features an extensive public roof garden on multiple levels. And it is widely seen as a model for future such developments in Singapore, but also in the region. Here, a more close up shot of the extensive public roof garden of the project. I will now give you a brief overview of the research dimensions that we have been interested in studying these projects. They are all termed services that dense and green developments can provide. I'm gonna start with regulating services. The first one refers to uh, the effect of dense and green buildings upon urban microclimate, uh, their contributions to mitigating urban heat islands and stormwater management. The second uh, dimension are social cultural services. Uh, those refer to the contribution of dense and green buildings to human psychological well-being and culture. Uh, such buildings can increase the amenity value and attractiveness of the urban landscape and offer recreational potential. 
The third refers to supporting services that are underlying all the other services and contribute to the overall resilience of the urban system. Key supporting services of dense and green buildings include their support of higher levels of biodiversity. And last but not least, the fourth dimension we're interested in refers to the contribution of dense and green buildings to land value appreciation. CODA. This slide provides you with a short summary of our most important research findings to date. Dense and green developments provide important regulating services such as mitigating urban heat island effects. They can offset solar radiation interception. For example, greenery implemented in the research case studies in Singapore led to a decrease of surface temperature of up to 23.5 degrees Celsius. Dense and green developments can provide important supporting services such as the increase of uh, urban biodiversity and resilience. Dense and green uh, developments provide important socio-cultural services such as fostering social and cultural integration. So we found that uh, they can contribute significantly to human psychological well-being. Such buildings can further increase the amenity value and attractiveness of urban landscape and offer recreational potential. By providing places where people can meet, rest, and play, they foster social and cultural integration. Next, uh, dense and green developments are affordable in terms of construction and maintenance costs. In our research, we found that construction and maintenance costs of dense and green buildings were variable, but generally quite affordable. They contributed between 1.5 and 4.5% to the overall cost of such buildings. Last but not least, dense and green developments can provide important economic services, such as contributions to economic sustainability and land value appreciation. In our research, we found that dense and green buildings are generally valued by property purchasers and add to the economic value of the urban context and as such to that of the whole city. I will end my short presentation with this photograph of a playground uh, in one of the roof gardens of Kampung Admiralty, a project that I shared with you earlier. I hope what I shared with you uh, just now illustrates how urban density can be designed and can actually be designed well. I believe that designing for density can be the ultimate test of intelligent design that can help make our cities more beautiful, more livable, more sustainable, and more resilient. Thank you very much. Wow, thank you, Thomas. Um, how inspiring. Uh, um, so much to, to, to be excited about there in terms of bringing the outside in and the inside out. That's very, very exciting. And, and as I say, in, in, inspiring. Picked up in particular on the, the benefits of mitigating urban heat island effect and also offsetting solar radiation both of which have a role to play in terms of potentially reducing energy consumption for our HVAC systems. So uh, lots and lots of material in there. Thank you, Thomas. We've got, we've got two great questions in the chat here. Uh, 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 first one from Luke Temple. Does the climate in Singapore aid the ability to create these green spaces? How does the work and research done here translate to countries with harsh or less ideal environments? Yeah, that's, that's, of course, a great question, is a, is a question that we get all the time when we present the, the work in the other climates. Um, yes, of course, Singapore is a, is a great place for exploring the dense and green paradigm because uh, we have pleasant temperatures year round. Things grow very fast. Uh, so, yes, the climate favors uh, such developments. And I think it, it comes as no surprise, right, that Singapore has established itself as a, as a testing ground for these strategies. However, in our research, we have focused on Singapore simply for the fact that uh, the National Research Foundation that funded the research is in Singapore. So they're primarily interested in uh, understanding uh, these projects in, in our tropical context. But we have also studied a couple of projects in other uh, climatic zones. Um, for example, uh, the Bosco Verticale in uh, Milan in Italy, 
uh, which you might all be familiar with. I think this is a, a very interesting project as well. We have also studied uh, one central uh, square in uh, Sydney in Australia. So those projects exist in, in other contexts. And uh, we actually found similar results, right? So these projects, they, they work very well. Maybe the performative component is, is not the driving one in some of these cases. But remember, we studied other dimensions as well. So we studied um, the social performance of these buildings. Uh, we studied the economic performance of these buildings. And we found uh, very similar performances uh, in those other places. But uh, we intend to do more studies in other climatic zones as well to verify if what we find in Singapore can actually work in other places as well. Thanks, Thomas. Uh and the final question for this morning, which is a superb question from Kate de Selling Court. I think the answer may be a PhD thesis actually, but uh, <laughs> let's have a go at this. What are the embodied and operational energy implications of supporting and watering planting with large plants, trees like you've shown at height? Is there an industry standard in terms of kilowatt hours per meter squared per annum? Um, how much of this is offset by reduced cooling <laughs> Maybe three PhDs. Okay, okay, okay. <laughs> I, I think that that's a bit, you know, I mean, these are all great questions, obviously, but but I think it's a bit beyond what, what I can answer today. Uh, but I, I want to maybe shift my, my answer towards, um, you know, how a lot of these projects, uh, and they have been around for about a decade in Singapore, so there has been some experience with what to do and what not to do. Uh, so let me just highlight that the, the simpler the detailing, the better these buildings are, right? So if you have very complicated systems that bring the water up and distribute the water on those facades, uh, those systems, uh, they, they often fail, right? And then the result, as you can imagine, is, is really not a beautiful building, but a really kind of awfully looking building. So uh, many of the most recent uh, projects, for example, OASIA Downtown Hotel, which is a project I haven't included today, but some of you might be familiar with, which has an entirely green facade right in the middle of uh, the, the CBD area in Singapore. If you, if you look at the, the detail, it's, it's actually very simple on every level. There's simply a planter box that is behind a screen that the plants, creepers can grow through. So you can literally go there and water it with a bucket, right? Uh, and it, it works beautifully. So I know it doesn't really answer all the questions that were asked, but uh, maybe uh, give you a, a hint uh, where uh, at least in, in terms of detailing where things are going in the, in the context of uh, Singapore. It also rains a lot in Singapore. So sometimes uh, there, there are many days on which you don't have to actually water the plants. Uh, they just happily grow by themselves, being exposed to the climate that we have here. Thank you. Okay, I will I will just read out this last question, Jim. Thank you for this. And that is, does the dense green building approach pay for itself or is policy support needed to make it happen? Also a, a, a great question. I mean, I showed you the, the lush uh, scheme that we have here in Singapore, which is of course put in place by the, the respective government agencies to, to push this agenda. Uh, what we have found, uh, and actually interestingly, not just in the Singapore context, but in the context of other places that we looked at as well, is that uh, very often in, term of, in terms of return on investment, these buildings are very much worth doing uh, because people are willing to pay higher rents. Uh, in the case of the Park Royale on Pickering, which is largely a hotel, a four-star hotel, people are willing to pay five-star hotel uh, prices just to be in a beautiful building like this. So it's, it's paying off inside the building, but it's also interestingly paying off for all the neighboring buildings. Uh, because what we observe is that if you have a dense and green building right in front of your maybe traditional uh, building, that the rents in the neighboring buildings go up as well, just because people appreciate the beautiful view that they have on 
uh, the, the greenery right in front of them. And it's actually a similar effect that you can see uh, in the case of, of the High Line in New York, right? The High Line is, is a linear park. I'm, I'm sure you're familiar with this and you know what that did to the real estate market uh, in, the, in the neighboring districts. Uh, it's, it's now one of the poshest areas in, in New York. Uh, so yes, it pays off. And uh, that is again, uh, one aspect that we were particularly interested in because that is a question that we also get all the time from developers. Is it actually worth doing this? So the short answer is yes, absolutely. It's worth doing it. Great, thank you. And it's time now to, to let you uh, get, uh, get back to your evening meal, I think, Thomas. Thank you, uh, thank you very much. Thank you for okay. having me. That brings us to the end of, of this morning's session. Um, I'd like to, to, to thank all of you in the audience for, um, uh, for joining us and staying with us and for the questions. But um, in particular, I'd like to thank our speakers, all of whom have given their time freely and, and, and um, given us some, some real food for thought across a, um, a multidisciplinary uh, um, subject here. So thank you very much to all of our speakers. Um, it is our intention to make all of the slides available to you um, and, and we'll let you know how you can access those in due course. So now we will break until until 1.15, that's 1.15 British summer time, uh, uh, at which point we'll meet again here on this, um, on this um, Zoom channel. Thank you all very much. <laughs>